Good morning, Dr. Phil here. Today we will be discussing on the principles of ultrasound imaging in anesthesia and critical care. Introduction An understanding of the physics of ultrasound imaging is fundamental to the ability to adequately acquire and interpret ultrasound images. Various interrelated factors determine the quality of the ultrasound image, such as the ultrasound transducer, depth of the structure of interest, and gain. Physics Principles of Ultrasound Imaging Ultrasound Waves A sound wave is a pressure disturbance that travels through a medium as vibrations of the molecules along the line of propagation in a series of compressions and rarefactions. Wavelength is the distance between two consecutive peaks or throws. The symbol is lambda, unit is meter or millimeter, frequency is number of wavelengths per second. High frequency waves have shorter wavelengths than lower frequency waves. The unit is hertz. Amplitude is the signal intensity of a wave or loudness of the sound. Unit is decibel. Speed of sound equals frequency times wavelength. Propagation velocity is the speed at which sound moves through a medium and depends on the density of the medium and compressibility of the medium, i.e. acoustic impedance. Different tissues have different propagation velocities. The average speed of ultrasound moving through human soft tissue is 1540 meters per second at 37 degrees Celsius. This gives wavelengths of 0.5 to 0.1 millimeter for frequencies of 3 to 10 megahertz. Rapid transmission and reception of pulses of sound allows generation of dynamic images. As the ultrasound wave passes from one tissue to another, the velocity changes at interfaces between tissues where there is a marked change in velocity. A significant amount of sound energy is lost. Ultrasound are sound waves oscillating at a frequency of more than 20 kHz, which is above the threshold of human hearing. The range of audible sound waves for humans ranges from 20 Hz to 20 kHz. Ultrasound imaging uses frequencies between 1 and 20 MHz. The piezoelectric effect is the phenomenon by which a mechanical stress may be induced in certain crystalline substances when a potential difference is applied across them. It is also known as the phenomenon by which a potential difference may be produced across certain crystalline substances when they are subject to a mechanical stress. This phenomenon is reversible. Generation of ultrasound waves. Ultrasound transducers use piezoelectric crystals to generate and receive ultrasound. Most transducers use artificial polycrystalline ferroelectric materials or ceramics, such as lead zirconate titanate. When high frequency alternating voltage is applied to the two sides of a piezoelectric crystal transducer, this results in changes in the thickness of the crystal and causes rapid expansion and contraction of the crystal. This produces compressions and refractions, and ultrasound waves are emitted. Applying an electric current to a piezoelectric crystal aligns the polarized particles with the crystal surface, and this changes the shape of the crystal. There is conversion of electrical energy to mechanical energy as vibrations, the frequency of the transmitted sound wave is determined by the thickness and shape of the piezoelectric material and the current applied to it. Only very short bursts such as 2-3 to three cycles of sound waves are produced by the transducer. This is done by damping the piezoelectric crystal shortly after applying the voltage to it. The probe then switches to receive mode to pick up the sound waves that are reflected back from the tissue. Interactions of ultrasound waves with tissues include reflection, refraction, dispersion, absorption, and divergence. Once the ultrasound wave is generated and transmitted into the tissues, the wave either bounces off tissues and returns to the probe to be displayed as a returning echo, as a reflection, or it can be lost and not returned due to attenuation. Reflection of ultrasound waves Ultrasound waves are partly reflected at the boundaries of tissue interfaces with differing acoustic impedance. 
Only waves that are reflected back to the transducer will be able to form ultrasound images. Conditions where there is a large proportion of the ultrasound beam being reflected, the greater the difference in acoustic impedance between the two tissues, the more ultrasound waves are reflected. For example, interface between tissues of different densities such as air and bone. Interfaces that are perpendicular to the ultrasound beam will reflect waves back to the probe with the greatest extent. The law of reflection states that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Reflection is maximized by maintaining a perpendicular incidence of the ultrasound probe or beam to the tissue being imaged. As the angle of incidence decreases from 90 degrees, some of the ultrasound beam is reflected away from the transducer and will not form part of the image. Large, flat interfaces perpendicular to the ultrasound wave produce better reflections and are termed specular reflection. Anisotropy is the condition where the visibility of certain structures or tissues, such as nerves and tendons, depends highly on the angle of insonation. When a high proportion of ultrasound waves are reflected back, this prevents imaging of structures deep to the interface. Conversely, with little reflection, the ultrasound beam penetrates deep to the interface. Next is attenuation. This refers to some of all lost ultrasound energy that does not reflect back to the probe and is composed of refraction, scattering, absorption, and divergence. Refraction is the bending of the ultrasound beam when it encounters tissues of differing acoustic impedance at oblique angles. It is inversely proportional to the angle of incidence of the ultrasound wave to the interface. Refraction is maximal when the beam and the tissue plane are nearly parallel. Refraction is minimal when they are perpendicular. Refraction is more common in fatty tissue and when the probe is angulated. Globules of dense fat in a matrix of less dense fat may cause poor visualization. Scattering. Ultrasound wave is scattered in all directions when structures are smaller than the wavelength of the ultrasound beam, such as in tissue parenchyma. Increased scattering results in increased signal attenuation. This gives a speckled appearance of the tissue, but is not a true image of the cellular anatomy, as that is too small to be resolved. Ultrasound absorption occurs when there is conversion of sound energy to heat. As ultrasound waves passes through tissues, the molecules vibrate Energy is lost as heat and there is diminution of the signal. Ultrasound divergence describes the spreading out of the beam energy as it moves away from the source. For attenuation, eventually the energy of the beam is reduced to the extent that no useful reflections will be detected. Total attenuation equals attenuation coefficient times depth. For each unit of depth, more ultrasound signal strength is lost. Attenuation coefficient is proportional to frequency. The higher the ultrasound frequency, the greater the scattering, the greater the absorption as heat, and the higher the amount of attenuation per unit of depth. Low frequencies are attenuated less and will penetrate tissues better than higher frequencies. Attenuation of ultrasound can be expressed as the half power distance, which refers to the depth at which the sound is halved. The half power distance is 3,800 mm for water, 6 to 10 mm for muscle, 2 to 7 mm for bone, and less than 1 mm for air and lung. Generation of ultrasonographic images of tissues. The piezoelectric crystal transduces the reflected waves from the tissues, producing alternating electrical current from which a computer-generated cross-sectional image can be displayed. The cycle of transmission and reception the pulse echo principle can be repeated up to 7,000 times per second. Regarding pulse echo mode, in most diagnostic ultrasound scans, the transducer spends around 1% of the time sending bursts of ultrasound impulses and 99% of the time listening for returning echoes, resulting in a duty factor of 1%. Pulse repetition frequency, PRF, refers to the number of pulses of send and listen cycles that are sent each second. When the depth setting is increased, there is reduction in PRF 
as echoes from deeper tissue require a longer time to return to the transducer. Ultrasound images are created by the detection and subsequent display of reflected ultrasound waves. Piezoelectric crystals in the transducer generate a brief pulse of ultrasound waves and then enter a receiving mode where they detect reflected ultrasound waves. Assuming the average speed of sound in human tissues is 1540 meters per second, the machine calculates the distance the sound wave travels prior to the reflection and plots this as a point on the screen. Ultrasound signals are unable to penetrate bone or gas-filled structures such as the lung. Scanning This occurs in the linear array or curvy linear probe. 2D ultrasound images are generated by probes, which comprises an array of parallel piezoelectric elements that are activated in sequence rather than simultaneously. The ultrasound beam is electronically scanned along the length of the transducer by exciting only small subsets of piezoelectric crystals in order. This produces a narrow ultrasound beam. Reflected echoes are processed into a two-dimensional picture as sequential lines of the image. This wavefront can scan a 90-degree sector of tissue. Scanning across the field of view takes 0.1 seconds. This high frame rate allows visualization of moving objects. The linear array probe has all the crystal elements, up to 200 of them, lying along the flat surface of the transducer, and this produces a rectangular field of view. A curvy linear array transducer has the elements arranged in a convex arc, and this produces a sector shaped image. Grayscale B mode or brightness mode. Each returning echo from the tissues is represented by a spot on the image whose brightness corresponds to the strength of the returning signal. The ultrasound image is built up from individual points corresponding to depth and strength of reflections from ultrasound beams scanned along the transducer. By representing the strength of the returning echoes from each depth as a spot whose brightness depends on the echo strength and depth position, Calculated from the time delay, each vertical line of an ultrasound image is produced. One line of an image is produced by a grayscale corresponding to the strength of reflected signals from different depths. Stronger reflections produce signals of greater amplitude, which produces a brighter or whiter image. The time from pulse to echo is related to the depth of the structure that produced the echo. Time from pulse to echo equals two times depth divided by speed of sound, which is assumed to be constant at 1540 meters per second. By placing such lines next to each other as the ultrasound beam is scanned along the transducer, a complete image of a slice through the tissue is produced. Images of tissues may be hyperechoic, hypoechoic, anechoic, or isoechoic. Structures that strongly reflect ultrasound generate large signal intensities and appear whiter or hyperechoic. There is higher density of sound waves compared to the surrounding structures. Examples include bone, facial planes, and air tissue interfaces. Structures that weakly reflect ultrasound generate lower signal intensities and appear darker or hypoechoic. There is lower density of sound waves compared to surrounding structures. Tissues appear darker as they are less reflective. Examples of hypoechoic structures include muscle, fat, and fluids such as blood. Structures that do not reflect ultrasound generate no signal intensities and appear black or anechoic. Structures that produce ultrasound echoes equal to those of neighboring tissues are isoechoic. Nerves can either be hyperechoic or hypoechoic. For example, Cervical nerve roots in the neck are hypoechoic and appear dark, but by the time they have formed divisions at the lateral border of the first rib, they are hyperechoic and white. Time gain compensation Echoes reflected from deeper structures are weaker than those from closer structures in grayscale image production, as the ultrasound waves have to travel through more tissue and thus is subject to more attenuation. The image gets dimmer at greater depths. To compensate for this during processing of the signal, the ultrasound machine software applies increasing amplification to the returning echo signals over time, also known as time gain compensation, TGC. 
This theoretically provides an image of uniform brightness when scanning a homogeneous organ. However, a penetration limit still occurs for a given probe. When very high gain is being applied for structures beyond the penetration limit, only noise is being amplified. Tissue harmonic imaging. This is a feature of modern ultrasound equipment that can lead to images with less noise. Harmonic frequencies are integer multiples of the frequency of the transmitted ultrasound pulse, also known as the fundamental frequency or first harmonic. As the fundamental frequency passes into the tissue, echoes of several different frequencies are generated. This produces indistinct tissue interfaces. The use of harmonic imaging eliminates some of these artifactual reflections by focusing on the fundamental and second harmonic frequency. This increases signal-to-noise ratio and better imaging in patients who are otherwise technically difficult to examine by ultrasound. Effects of Ultrasound Frequency The higher the frequency, the better the resolution of the image. The higher the frequency, the lower the tissue penetration due to rapid attenuation. The lower the frequency, the lower the resolution of the image. The lower the frequency, the higher the tissue penetration. Lower frequencies will produce images from deeper structures. Ultrasound Resolution Resolution refers to the ultrasound machine's ability to distinguish one object from another. Lower resolution results in these objects blurring together. Higher resolution allows differentiation of objects. This is in the order of 0.5 to 1.5 mm. There are several types of resolution, including contrast resolution, spatial resolution, which can be further divided into axial resolution and lateral resolution, and finally, temporal resolution. Contrast resolution refers to the ability of the ultrasound machine to distinguish between two separate objects with similar echo reflective properties. The higher the contrast resolution, the more similar the objects may be while still being identified as separate. Contrast resolution may be enhanced at various stages in the imaging process, such as during compression, image memory, and due to contrast agents. Spatial resolution. This refers to the ability of an ultrasound system to distinguish between two points at a particular depth in tissue. The higher the spatial resolution, the closer the objects may be to each other while still being identified as separate. Spatial resolution may be considered in two planes. Axial, where two objects are lying atop one another parallel to the ultrasound beam, and lateral, where two objects lie side by side perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. Axial resolution refers to the ability to discriminate two objects within the line of the ultrasound beam and equals 1.5 times the pulse length. Two objects within the same pulse at the same time will reflect echoes back together and cannot be resolved. Good axial resolution requires short pulses with short wavelengths, i.e. high frequency. Lateral resolution refers to the ability to discriminate two objects lying across the ultrasound beam. It depends on having narrow and well-defined ultrasound beams, as two objects within the same beam will reflect echoes at the same time and cannot be resolved. Lateral resolution is always worse than axial resolution. Lateral resolution is better with higher frequency wavelengths and focusing. Focusing can be achieved electronically in the transducer array. Basic portable scanners tend to have a fixed focus generally to the center of the field of view. On higher end ultrasound scanners, the focal depth can be altered by the user. Set the focal depth to the depth of the target of interest. Outside the focal zone, the width of the beam will be wider Resolution will thus be poorer than it would have been if no focusing were to be applied. Temporal resolution refers to the ability to discriminate two different images in time. It is directly related to the frame rate. It is a function of the scanning or sweep speed along the ultrasound transducer. Poor temporal resolution results in movements appearing blurred. 
Temporal resolution is rarely of concern in regional anesthesia, so long as needle movements and injection of LA is slow. Acoustic window refers to the path that allows sound waves to penetrate the body to reach the structure of interest, reflect off that structure, and return to the probe at the surface. Examples of good acoustic windows include fluid and soft tissue densities, such as liver, spleen, and urine-filled bladder. Examples of poor acoustic windows include gas-filled structures such as intestines and lungs and bone. Posterior acoustic enhancement. This occurs when a structure, typically fluid-filled such as the bladder or a cyst, will attenuate fewer sound waves than the neighboring soft tissue. This causes area posterior to that structure having more ultrasound energy affecting it and generates correspondingly brighter reflections and appearing more hyper-echoic on the ultrasound display. Summary of how ultrasound imaging works. The ultrasound probe generates pulsed ultrasound waves of a set frequency via the piezoelectric effect. Ultrasound waves passes through the body to a depth determined by its frequency. A proportion of the sound wave is reflected to the transducer every time the wave reaches a boundary between two differing media. Reflected sound reaches the transducer, imparts mechanical energy, and this is converted to electrical energy via the piezoelectric effect. The time delay between the sound wave leaving the transducer and arriving back is used to calculate the distance it has traveled into the tissue. The more accurate reflective the medium is, the higher the energy of the reflected sound wave. A map is then constructed about the nature of the medium and its depth within the tissue for each pulse of ultrasound delivered. Next, we'll be discussing on ultrasound probes or transducers. Most ultrasound machines have various transducers that can be selected depending on the clinical indication. These transducers have intrinsic characteristics such as size, form factor, and frequency that makes them suited for a specific task. Examples of ultrasound transducers include the linear probe, the curvy linear probe, endocavity transducers, and the phased array probe. The linear probe. It is often referred to as the vascular or high-frequency probe. These have a long, narrow, rectangular probe face. The array is linear. Frequency is 6 to 13 MHz. Field depth is 1.5 to 6 cm. Resolution is 0.5 mm axial and 1 mm lateral. It is used for ultrasound imaging of soft tissue, musculoskeletal tissue, pediatrics, ocular, trachea, thyroid, thoracic, Procedural guidance, such as for vascular access, brachial plexus block, abdominal wall block, femoral and distal sciatic nerve block, DVT diagnosis, diagnosis of appendicitis, and testicular ultrasound. It may also come in the form of the hockey stick linear probe. Curvy linear probe can be small, microconvex, or large. Array is curved, frequency is 2 to 5 MHz, field depth 5 to 16 cm. Resolution is 2 mm axial and 3 mm lateral. Example of uses for abdominal imaging, such as in EFAST, imaging of the kidneys, aorta, IVC, bladder, bowel, uterus, and ovaries. The curvy linear probe may also be used during neuraxial block, lumbar plexus block, and proximal sciatic nerve block. Endocavity transducers are essentially microconvex curvy linear transducers on the end of a probe. These have a frequency range of 4 to 10 MHz and are used for transvaginal, transrectal, and pharyngeal ultrasound. Phased Array Probe These have a small, nearly square shaped probe face. Array is phased array. Frequency is 1 to 5 MHz. Field depth is 6 to 16 cm. Examples of uses Phased array probes are used in abdominal, pleural, and cardiac imaging. Its small footprint allows it to get between rib spaces. Ultrasound modalities. These include A mode, B mode, M mode, and Doppler modes, among others. A mode is also known as amplitude mode ultrasound. This mode displays depth on the x-axis and amplitude on the y-axis and is used in ophthalmology practice. B mode is also brightness mode. This has been discussed in detail previously. 
It uses an array of imaging crystals to generate a series of scan lines through a tissue plane to generate 2D images. B-mode ultrasound is also known as two-dimensional ultrasound. The image refreshes multiple times each second. The exact frame rate depends on multiple factors such as depth, width of sector of ultrasound image display. M-mode is also known as motion mode. It captures B-mode output at a very fast frame rate M mode narrows down to a single line of a B mode display to increase frame rate drastically to orders of magnitude higher than B mode. M mode has retained its prominence in the former ultrasound examination due to its extremely fast frame rate. The intensity of reflection is expressed in the degree of brightness. The depth is shown on the y axis and time shown on the x axis. M mode permits a still image to demonstrate motion. M-mode is useful in cardiology to measure dimensions of rapidly moving structures. In 2D echocardiography, the sector width is decreased to limit the amount of signal processing performed, and this allows for greater temporal resolution because of increased frame rate. In M-mode, the ultrasound beam is narrowed to one dimension to allow the sonographer to examine extremely fast moving structures such as valve leaflets and their behavior time throughout the cardiac cycle. For example, M-mode allows the sonographer to examine the fluttering of aortic valve leaflets and early closure, which can help make the diagnosis of dynamic left ventricular outflow obstruction. Doppler modes. The most common modes of Doppler ultrasound used clinically are color Doppler, pulsed wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, and tissue Doppler, which will be discussed in a later section. Ultrasound machine controls and applied physics. A basic understanding of the technical details of the ultrasound system controls, their capabilities and limitations, will help optimize image acquisition markedly. The use of ultrasound system controls is known as knobology, which is applied ultrasound physics. Every ultrasound machine is slightly different in terms of layout, but there exist distinct commonalities among different manufacturers and machines. Take the time to study and explore the ultrasound machine before putting it to use. Knowledge of system controls increases efficiency and speed in clinical imaging. It is important to be able to identify certain key controls such as depth, gain, frequency, focus, sector width, and freeze. Improve one's skill by scanning patients at every opportunity. Any patient with a known abnormality represents an opportunity to learn the ultrasound characteristics of that abnormality and this enables the detection of pathology in as yet undiagnosed patient. The on-off button is used to turn on or off the ultrasound machine. Maneuvering the ultrasound transducer. The transducer that is most appropriate for the clinical question at hand should be selected based on frequency required, trade-off between resolution and depth of penetration, and shape and form of the ultrasound probe. Choose the transducer with the best resolution and footprint for the depth and anatomic location of the structure of interest. Grasp the ultrasound transducer in a tripod grip, as if it were a pen, between the thumb on one side and the index and long finger on the other, close to the probe face. The fourth and fifth fingers and the side of the hand serves as a base for the tripod grip. This enables the hand to be anchored to a very small acoustic window without sliding away. Scan using the small muscles of the hand and wrist and not the larger muscles of the upper arm and shoulder to increase control and decrease fatigue. Apply gel generously across the region to be scanned. Apply the probe to the patient according to the external landmarks and orientation conventions. If no structures can be visualized, slide the probe in a small circle or spiral to reveal the acoustic window. The probe can then be stabilized by the tripod grip and the view improved by smaller, slower movements in other planes. Examples of transducer motions include sliding, rocking, sweeping, fanning, pressure or compression, and rotation. The next control is depth. After locating the acoustic window, the first control to adjust is the depth. Sufficient depth should be used to display the necessary structures. 
Taps should not be too much that the screen space deep to the structures of interest is wasted. The entire structure of interest should be visible in the top two-thirds of the screen to balance image resolution with imagery of the surrounding anatomy, which will provide context to the shot. Increasing depth causes reduced temporal resolution and increases signal-to-noise ratio. Imaging deep structures requires intelligent use of the focus control, which will be discussed later. Presets. Choose the applicable preset for optimal imaging, such as shock, lung, EFAST, cardiac, abdomen, ops, gin, and small parts. Gain. Gain amplifies the signal that the ultrasound transducer receives. It increases the amplitude of the incoming sound waves. Gain does not increase the output of the transducer. Gain is purely a control of the received signals. Gain is commonly confused with power, in which increasing power increases the signal output of the transducer. Appropriate gain. The screen will be neither too dark or too bright, enabling the distinction between tissues of varying acoustic impedance. A 10-bit ultrasound machine is capable of producing 1024 shades of grey. The human eye can only detect between 700 and 900 shades of grey. If the gain is too high or too low, the system will not render the full grey scale on the image, and thus important information will be lost. Proper gain adjustment can make an enormous difference when attempting to distinguish fine details such as endocardial borders or valvular pathology. Dial the gain high up and then back down until blood appears black in the image. Total gain controls the overall brightness of the screen by amplifying the brightness of all returning echoes equally. Time gain compensation, TGC. Sound waves are attenuated by the medium through which they travel. When placing an ultrasound transducer on a patient, the sound waves that travel the shortest distance through the tissue will have the largest amplitude, thus they will appear brighter than sound waves that travel to further depths. To produce an image of equal brightness throughout, it is important to optimize the TGC. TGC is typically controlled by a series of sliders. Each slider controls the brightness of a separate depth on the screen. TGC should be adjusted such that similar tissues display the same brightness from superficial to deep tissues. The degrees to which these adjustments are necessary are heavily dependent on the individual ultrasound machine, frequency of the transducer, and use of harmonic imaging. Therefore, there are no hard and fast rules regarding TGC adjustment. The sonographer should ensure equal brightness in the near and far fields. Typically, these sliders are set to lower the near field gain and progressively boost the far field gain. Compression, i.e. dynamic range. Dynamic range is adjustable on most ultrasound machines. The range of signals acquired by the transducer and ultrasound machine lie beyond the range of human detection. To produce a meaningful image, the machine must compress the wide spectrum of signals to a narrow range of visible shades of grey. This limited range of signals retain the characteristics of the original. The higher amplitude waves are still high and lower amplitude waves are still low. Power Output power does not equal gain. Gain amplifies the received signals. Power increases the amplitude of the ultrasound pulse from the transducer, and as a result, the received signals are stronger. Effects of increasing power includes increased ultrasound output, increased transducer temperature, increased patient exposure to ultrasound. The image may or may not appear brighter. Safety. Power is usually adjusted to the lowest possible level that yields clinically useful images. Most ultrasound machines come with preset power levels that conform to the ALARA principle and FDA guidelines. Power must be dialed down in the use of contrast agents to avoid excessive cavitation and rupture of the microspheres found in the agent. Each contrast agent is different and the exact power setting necessary for the agent is specified by the manufacturer. Frequency Frequency and focus can be manipulated to fine-tune the image. Use lower frequency for deeper penetration. Use higher frequency for shallower imaging and better resolution. 
a balance must be struck between imaging depth and resolution. Higher frequency results in better axial resolution of the image. Higher frequencies are attenuated more as they travel through soft tissue. Lower frequency waves are much better at imaging deep structures because of their lower attenuation. Preset frequencies include penetration mode, which uses lower frequencies to image deep structures at the expense of axial resolution. Resolution mode uses higher frequencies and should only be used on superficial structures. General mode is a compromise between the two extremes and is used for most imaging sessions. A structure is typically scanned in two orthogonal planes to understand the structure in three dimensions. Focus. The ultrasound beam can be divided into three parts, the near field, focal zone, and far field. The near field is the region close to the transducer, where the sound pressure undergoes through a series of maximums and minimums, and it ends at the last on-axis maximum at distance n from the face. Near field distance n represents the natural focus of the ultrasound transducer. The near field is as wide as the transducer. Focal zone. The beam converges into a width one half of the transducer size at the focal zone. This results in narrow beam size, which achieves the best lateral resolution in the entire imaging field. Adjust focal zone to the depth of or slightly deeper to the area of interest to optimize the imaging. Refinement of electronic beam formation technology has led to better resolution at this focal zone at the cost of decreasing performance outside of it. Certain machines may allow for multiple focal zones. This improves lateral resolution at the cost of frame rate and temporal resolution. Focal length refers to the distance from the transducer to the focus point. At two times the focal length, beam width equals the width of the transducer and beyond two times focal length, beam width exceeds the width of the transducer. Deeper structures will have poor lateral resolution if the focus is placed superficially and the imaging depth is increased. Some machines may change the focal point when the depth is changed. The far field is the region beyond N where the sound pressure gradually drops to zero as the beam diameter expands and its energy dissipates. The area beyond the near field where the ultrasonic beam is more uniform is called the far field. In the far field, the beam spreads out in a pattern originating from the center of the transducer. Sector size. The width of the image is adjustable with the sector size control, which is usually left at the widest possible image size. Reduction in sector width increases the frame rate of the area of interest and increases temporal resolution. When imaging deep structures, reducing sector width increases the frame rate of the area of interest this increases temporal resolution and image quality. When reducing sector size, a control becomes available which allows the sector position to be adjusted. This allows the sonographer to steer the ultrasound beam without moving the transducer. Zoom. Zoom allows the sonographer to select and zoom into an area of interest. It is typically used to magnify areas of interest to take measurements, for example, of valves and vessels. Capture the zoomed out shot first before acquiring the magnified image to show the surrounding structures and to provide context for the shot and to ensure that no significant pathology is missed in the vicinity of the scanning area. Note that the width and depth of the zoom will affect the frame rate of the image. Zoom does not improve image resolution because resolution is a function of sector width and imaging depth. Zoom merely makes the image bigger. Reject. This function allows the sonographer to filter out noises from the returning signal and eliminates the incoming data below a certain adjustable frequency threshold. Reject is not commonly used after initial setup of the ultrasound machine. The freeze function allows the sonographer to stop acquiring the ultrasound image and use a trackball to rewind to a clinically useful image. Examples of the uses of the freeze function to acquire images of the heart in end diastole, to obtain measurements of the myocardial thickness and internal chamber dimensions. Measure. This function is used to perform measurements of ultrasonographic images. One can scroll back from the last frozen image on the display 
to select the optimal image frame and to proceed with measurements. Storing image and video loops. The image storing capacity will vary depending on the ultrasonic device and the manufacturer options. One could store images or video loops on the internal hard drive of the device or a USB flash drive or burn to a CD or DVD or even transmit wirelessly to a computer. Some ultrasound machines have the print function to print images on paper. M mode. To use M mode, the sonographer first locates the structure of interest using the 2D ultrasound. Using the trackball to place the cursor through the targeted area, M mode is selected and the machine begins recording one dimensional data. In this mode, sweep speed, depth, and color are available as display options. The sweep speed controls the time scale and, more practically, how many bits of the heart are displayed on the screen if echocardiography is performed. Depth functions in a similar manner as 2D ultrasound with the same caveats regarding image brightness and signal intensity. The high resolution of M mode makes it ideal for making measurements such as wall thickness, chamber dimensions, movement of tricuspid annulus, etc. Doppler controls will be discussed in a later section. The Doppler effect and color Doppler. The Doppler effect describes the change in the reflected frequency of sound waves when an object reflecting sound is moving relative to the emitter. This change in frequency is known as the Doppler shift. Ultrasound waves reflected back from a static object have the same wavelength as the original beam. An object moving towards a source will reflect sound waves with a shorter wavelength than the original signal resulting in increased frequency, as each incoming wave is intercepted and reflected sooner by the object moving towards the source. An object moving away from a source will reflect sound waves with a longer wavelength than the original signal, resulting in reduced frequency. Calculation of velocity using ultrasound Doppler Velocity of the object can be calculated using the Doppler equation, which is V equals delta F times C divided by 2 times F0 times cosine theta, where V is the velocity of the object, delta F is referred to as the frequency drift, FR minus F0, where F0 is the frequency of sound waves emitted from the probe, and FR is the frequency of reflected sound waves of moving red blood cells back towards the probe. C is the speed of sound in blood, F0 is the frequency of sound waves emitted from the probe, theta is the angle of incidence between the sound and the object. Doppler ultrasound can be used to calculate the velocity and direction of blood flow using the above equation. The most accurate calculations occur with theta angles that are as close to 0 degrees as possible, as cosine 0 degrees equals 1. Thus, the angle between the direction of blood flow and the ultrasound signal should be kept to a minimum. The easiest way to detect Doppler shift is to put the output to normal loudspeaker or headphones as target velocities found in the body produces a Doppler frequency range of 0 to 5 kHz which is within the audible range. Calculation of flow using the ultrasound Doppler. If the cross-sectional area of the blood vessel is known, flow equals area times velocity Area of a blood vessel equals pi times radius to the power of 2. Ultrasound Doppler is used, for example, in cardiac output measurements. Doppler cardiac output monitors measure red blood cell velocity in the aorta. A velocity time graph can be generated from the Doppler flow signal. The area under this graph represents the velocity time integral, which represents the distance traveled by the red blood cell, the stroke distance. The product of VTI and the aortic cross-sectional area gives the volume of blood ejected per beat, i.e. stroke volume. The cardiac output can then be deduced by multiplying the heart rate by the stroke volume. Calculation of pressure gradients using ultrasound Doppler. Pressure gradients such as those across heart valves can be calculated by using the Doppler principle to measure the blood velocity and entering the result into the Bernoulli equation. Delta P equals 4 times V to the power of 2 where delta P is the pressure gradient and V is the velocity of blood. Common modes of Doppler ultrasound includes spectral Doppler, which consists of 
pulsed wave Doppler, continuous wave Doppler, and tissue Doppler. And another mode of Doppler is color flow Doppler. Spectral Doppler. Spectral Doppler uses the frequency shift as color Doppler, but displays the information as a tracing of velocity on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. Frequency drift can also be demonstrated with audio in real time. Spectral Doppler is usually displayed with a small B-mode image above the velocity tracing. Modes of Spectral Doppler Pulsed Wave Doppler Pulsed Wave Doppler is used to determine the velocity profile of a specific region of blood flow, such as the left and right ventricular outflow tract, aortic outflow tract to estimate stroke volume, descending thoracic aorta, mitral valve inflow in diastole, and hepatic and pulmonary vein flow. Physics Pulse wave Doppler is formed by pulses of ultrasound energy, and the machine is able to listen for echoes that return only from the area inside the gate. The transducer sends a burst or pulse of ultrasound wave towards the sampling volume at a specific frequency, also known as the pulse repetition frequency, PRF. The system then waits for a determined period depending on depth to listen only to signals returning from the side of the sampling volume. Doppler signal is ignored above and below the sampling volume to distinguish regional flow variations as well as target specific areas of interest. The shift in frequency between the transmitted sound waves and returning sound waves is a function of the velocity of blood moving through the area of interest. This velocity is then plotted on the y-axis as a function of time on the x-axis. Aliasing Pulse wave Doppler is unable to measure very high velocities due to aliasing. The transducer samples the incoming signal at the determined rate. If the received signal is moving fast in comparison to the sampling frequency or PRF, it may appear to the machine that it is moving in the opposite direction, which is referred to as aliasing. The velocity tracing will cut off at a specific velocity and then wrap around to the other side of the baseline. Aliasing is a result of the Nyquist limit, the upper limit of velocity of the Doppler shift that can be displayed, and is the speed at which aliasing occurs. Nyquist limit equals PRF divided by 2. Shallow sampling volume. When the sample volume is close to the transducer, the signal is able to travel to and from the area of interest relatively quickly. Therefore, at shallow depths, aliasing is much less of a concern. For deep sample volumes, increased depth of the sampling volume causes the system to require more time to receive the returning sample of the signal, and this increases the likelihood of aliasing. Thus, pulse wave Doppler has limitations on the maximal velocity of blood flow that it can measure and is determined by the depth of the sampling volume and PRF. Aliasing can be minimized by a few techniques, but limits the ability of pulse wave Doppler to measure the high velocities commonly found in valvular disease. These techniques will be discussed later. Controls for pulse wave Doppler Pulse wave Doppler has a vertical cursor that can be manipulated across the image and a small gate that can shift location and size. Velocity measurement is made only along this line inside the gate. All other velocities will be ignored. Thus, pulse wave Doppler has range specificity, which is ideal for determining the velocity of blood at a particular point. To use pulse wave Doppler, obtain a 2D view of the area of interest, control the cursor with the track ball or touch screen, the plane through which the pulse wave is determined with horizontal movements, the sample volume is the target of the pulse wave signal, it is controlled with vertical movements. It is represented as either horizontal lines along the dotted cursor line or as a large bald dot on the cursor line. Position this sample volume precisely on the area of interest. Once this sample volume is targeted properly, the pulse wave button is activated and the ultrasound machine will begin pulse wave mode. Dials become available to control for the scale, sweep speed, gain and baseline. The scale determines the y-axis scale, which is represented in either centimeters per second or meters per second. The scale should be adjusted such that the entire Doppler envelope is seen, 
but large enough to make accurate measurements. Sweep speed. This is adjusted so that the envelopes are wide enough to comfortably trace. Adjust this control to include 4 to 5 envelopes per screen. Baseline. This is responsible for the zero position on the y-axis. If the interrogator signal is moving away from the probe, set the baseline high on the display to allow the scale to be optimized and maximize the envelope. The larger the envelope, the easier it will be to take subsequent measurements. Gain. This is adjusted in the pulse wave mode in the same way in 2D imaging. Over or under adjustment of gain may lead to errors in measurement. Adjust the gain so that blood in 2D image appears black. It may be necessary to determine the spectral velocity changes with other hemodynamic events, such as breathing or valsava maneuvers. The next type of spectral Doppler is continuous wave Doppler. This is used to identify high velocity jets, as seen in cases of valvular or subvalvular stenosis. Mechanism of action. Continuous wave Doppler uses two piezoelectric crystals, one sending ultrasound waves continuously and the other receiving continuously. The velocities displayed represents all of the motion detected along the entire Doppler cursor. There is range ambiguity. The system is able to measure high velocities of blood along the direction of the cursor. However, it is unable to determine at what depth these velocities occur. The continuous stream of ultrasound energy limits the ability of the machine to distinguish the origin of a particular velocity. Continuous wave Doppler is not subject to Nyquist limit limitations as pulse wave Doppler. This is thus ideal for measuring very fast velocity when it is not necessary to know where is it found. The machine is able to avoid the errors inherent to sampling and aliasing seen in pulse wave Doppler through continuous beam transmission and reception. Examples of use cases includes to find the fastest jet of tricuspid regurgitation to estimate pulmonary pressures and to assess the stenotic valve. Controls. To use continuous wave Doppler, the cursor is selected and using the trackball, the direction of continuous wave beam is determined. The placement of the sample volume is irrelevant due to range ambiguity. The next type of spectral Doppler is tissue Doppler. This is essentially pulse wave Doppler that is filtered differently to evaluate slower velocities of tissues compared with intracardiac blood flow. It is used to assess myocardial motion during the evaluation of diastolic dysfunctions as well as other clinical questions. Tissue Doppler TDI, applies a filter that allows only the high amplitude and low velocity signals to pass through. It is useful to examine myocardial function it is used to determine the diastolic function of the left heart through the examination of the E-velocity and it is used to assess the systolic function of the right heart through the measurement of S. Color flow Doppler Velocity information from Doppler ultrasound may be shown graphically as a Doppler waveform display as in spectral Doppler or it may be used to color an overlay map that is superimposed on the grayscale image also known as Color Doppler Ultrasound, CDU, or Color Flow Mapping, CFM. Color Doppler Ultrasound is able to display blood flow in real time based on velocity and direction. Activating the Color Doppler causes a box to appear on the screen, which can be moved to overlie the area of interest. Any movement inside the box is depicted by shades of various colors, demonstrating its velocity and direction relative to the probe face, superimposed on the B image. Flow towards the probe may be shown as red through yellow for increasing velocities. Flow away from the probe is shown as blue through green for increasing velocities. The color green can be added when blood flow velocity exceeds a preset limit. Areas of turbulent flow, for example across a diseased cardiac valve, may show all three colors. Only part of the image where there is movement will show color if the movement of blood within a blood vessel is 90 degrees to the direction of the ultrasound beam, no color filling will be seen. Color flow Doppler is used to diagnose and grade the severity of valvular regurgitation, to map the location of atrial and ventricular septal defects, to identify blood vessels during nerve blocks to avoid puncturing them, to identify blood vessels for cannulation, etc. 
controls. The color button toggles on and off the color Doppler mode. Most ultrasound machines allow the user to define a color map as discussed above. Restrictions and limitations. Color Doppler is subject to aliasing as a function of the Nyquist limit. A fast moving incoming jet may change from red to blue to red again. This aliasing is determined by the PRF or Nyquist limit as discussed above. The Nyquist limit is adjustable in color Doppler mode, often labeled baseline. This controls the PRF. For low velocity jets, it may be better characterized by a lower Nyquist limit. For higher velocity jets, it may be better characterized by a higher Nyquist limit. Degradation of frame rate is another restriction. Frame rate during color Doppler is about half the frame rate of 2D B-mode ultrasound as ultrasound machines alternate the imaging of color Doppler and the 2D image. Color sector width affects the frame rate in the same way as with 2D sector width. The wider the sector, the lower the resulting frame rate. The color sector should be widened at the outset to scan for possible jets of interest, then immediately narrowed in the following images to increase temporal resolution. Color Power Doppler is a form of color Doppler ultrasound that disregards the direction of flow and displays motion as an orange signal. It is used for functions that have a higher sensitivity for flow but do not give directional information. It is very useful for identifying flow in low flow states such as in ovarian or testicular ultrasound. Techniques to optimize the Doppler mode Obtain the best possible B-mode acoustic window and adjust gain appropriately, minimize the depth and sector width as much as feasible to increase frame rate, position color Doppler box or spectral Doppler cursor over the area of interest, size the box or gate to appropriate size as small as possible but large enough to answer the clinical question to increase frame rate. Steer. If performing vascular ultrasound, steer the color Doppler box so that the vessel transverses the long axis of the parallelogram. In cardiac ultrasound, the sample volume is not typically angle corrected or steered. Angle correction. For arterial ultrasound, the sample volume should be as close to parallel to the flow as possible. An acceptable angle correction is 60 degrees. In cardiac ultrasound, the sample volume is not typically angle corrected. Gain. Turn up the color gain until the artifactual signal appears from tissues without flow then reduce gain until artifact disappears. Baseline. Adjust the baseline up or down depending on the direction of the waveform of interest to minimize aliasing. Pulse repetition frequency should be adjusted to minimize aliasing. Causes of inadequate ultrasound images. This includes inappropriate gain. Excessive gain results in images that appear excessively white with poorly defined structures. Gain set too low results in a dark image, and some structures may not be displayed. Attenuation of ultrasound signals by air. Air is a relatively poor conductor of sound, thus water-based gels are used to improve contact between the probe and the skin to overcome this problem. However, air beneath the skin surface may be more problematic. For example, when trying to image thoracic structures lying deep to the lungs, or in the case of subcutaneous emphysema. Ultrasound artifacts. An artifact is any feature in an image that is not true or accurate one-to-one -one depiction of the target being imaged. The user must understand how artifacts are formed and learn to recognize them in order not to misinterpret the images. Correct diagnosis comes through understanding the physical processes involved, correctly driving the scanner, and having a good knowledge of the anatomy being examined. Contact artifacts. Shadowing or lack of image appears from the top of the image. This indicates a contact problem between the probe and the skin. Due to a hollow curved surface of the skin, lack of gel on the skin, or faulty transducer. Acoustic shadowing. This occurs where tissues distal to a highly refractive structure are poorly visualized or absent. Examples of highly reflective structures include bone, calcification, or a vessel wall viewed edgeways. No ultrasound will reach any distal targets, and a dark shadow will appear deep to the obscuring target on the image. 
tissues with high reflectivity will reflect the majority of the ultrasound signal back towards the transducer, leaving little signal to penetrate deeper structures. This causes dropout, which appears as a poor or absent image behind a bright structure. In the case of calcification, this together with a bright reflection from the proximal surface can be diagnostic. Edge artifact. This occurs at the lateral border of a circular structure, such as vessel or gallbladder, as the ultrasound beam approaches nearly at a tangent to the structure. This results in increased refraction at this interface and a dark artifact deep to this edge. Post-cystic enhancement. This artifact appears as an inappropriately bright area on the image behind a fluid-filled structure such as cyst or blood vessel. It results from the application of TGC across a region of low echogenicity as is found in a fluid. TGC continues to increase the gain with depth even though the ultrasound pulse is only weakly attenuated. The echoes distal to the cyst then have too much gain applied relative to the adjacent solid tissue and so appear brighter. Post-cystic enhancement is useful in that it is usually diagnostic of a fluid field as opposed to a solid structure and thus TGC should not be adjusted. Incorrect adjustments of TGC and gain controls may itself produce artifact in an image as information is lost or misread due to poor technique by the operator. Reflection artifacts. Some anatomical structures have a large smooth surface and can act as mirror reflectors of ultrasound such as the diaphragm, bone or pleura. A second or reflected image then appears in a place on the image where anatomically it is unlikely to be. For example, on color doppler over the clavicular region, a second image of the subclavian artery is seen in the lungs. Reverberation. This occurs as the result of ultrasound waves bouncing back and forth between two strongly specular reflectors, for example, the skin and a deeper structure such as the pleural line, a metallic structure such as a needle or wire, or from air in soft tissues. The result is usually multiple linear and hyperechoic areas distal to the reflecting structures. In regional anesthesia, this predominantly occurs between the needle and the probe surface, especially when the needle is perpendicular to the ultrasound beam. Section thickness artifact. This is caused by echo signal averaging within the section thickness. It is often clinically noticeable as low-level echoes in an anechoic structure and may mimic debris in the bladder or sludge in the gallbladder. Side lobe artifact results from strong reflectors outside the main ultrasound beam. These reflect back off-axis low-energy beams and are displayed overlying the main image. It typically appears in anechoic or hypoechoic structures such as the bladder. This artifact is a limitation of ultrasound itself and cannot be avoided but should be recognized. Refraction artifacts. An ultrasound image is built up on the assumption that the speed of sound in soft tissue is 1540 meters per second. In reality, there will be variations of up to 5% around this value. These differences in speed of sound may cause the beam to be bent by refraction at large interfaces with different speeds of sound on either side. In regional anesthesia, this is commonly seen as a bent needle as it passes through two tissues of different acoustic impedance such as fat and muscle. This has been termed as the bayonet artifact. This does not present difficulty with needling technique as the tip of the needle is accurately represented relative to the surrounding structures even if the needle has a step in the shaft. Electrical interference. Diatomy uses high frequency current and causes electrical interference resulting in a series of rippled lines across the image. Clinical uses of ultrasound in intensive care and anesthesia. Application of ultrasound in regional nerve blockade. Benefits of ultrasound guided regional anesthesia. With ultrasound, the operator is able to view an image of the target nerve directly, guide the needle under real time visualization, navigate away from sensitive anatomy, monitor the spread of LA, 
block nerves at any point along their course without relying on previously used landmarks, make real-time procedural adjustments. Ultrasound-guided regional anesthesia is regarded by many as a technique that is faster, safer, and more efficacious than landmark or nerve-stimulator-assisted methods. However, the evidence for these assumptions are absent, and controlled trials to support this view may be a long time coming. UGRA is particularly useful for patients with obscure anatomical landmarks, coagulopathy, neuropathology, or trauma. Nerve fascicles themselves are dark, whereas supporting connective tissue tends to be brighter and more hyperechoic. This is a generalization because the varying structure of the fascia which invests a particular nerve means that the same nerve may have a different ultrasound appearance along its course. Superficial nerves and plexuses are more suitable for UGRA than those sighted more deeply. The sciatic nerve in the buttock, for example, is a large structure that is nonetheless difficult to identify because of attenuation of the beam by surrounding gluteal muscles. Advancing needles are best displayed if they are parallel to the probe surface. At angles greater than 45 degrees, they become difficult to see. In central neuraxial techniques, ultrasound-assisted location may help confirm the depth to the epidural space, the midline, or the spinal level, but real-time guidance is more difficult given that both spinals and epidurals are two-handed techniques, so its use is not yet routine. It is important to understand how to obtain and capture an image, differentiate true image from artifacts, introduce a needle, place it close to a nerve and deliver local anesthetic to surround the nerve. The components required to achieve these are image capture, image optimization, image interpretation, and needling techniques. Image capture. Many companies now produce ultrasound machines that offer quality and resolution capabilities adequate for use in regional anesthesia. Ultrasound machines should include basic image optimization features, technique-specific settings for nerve or vascular imaging, Doppler function, image storage features, enhanced imaging techniques such as tissue harmonics and multi-beam technology. Probe choice. From a clinical perspective, there are two key concepts, resolution and penetration. As a general rule, always use the highest frequency probe available for the depth of target structure to be imaged. For high frequency probes, image resolution increases with ultrasound frequency, hence high frequency probes will give improved image detail. However, high frequencies are attenuated more rapidly as they pass through tissue. As a consequence, they can only be used to image superficial structures, generally under 4 to 6 cm in depth, such as the brachial plexus and certain peripheral nerves. For low-frequency probes to image deeper, this probe should be used, sacrificing image resolution for increased depth and penetration, such as for the lumbar plexus and proximal sciatic nerve. The probe's footprint. The size of the probe face may limit access, for example in the supraclavicular fossa or in the pediatric group, and in these cases smaller probes may be needed. Acoustic coupling. Acoustic coupling is used to eliminate air between the probe and the skin, which attenuates ultrasound, and to act as a lubricant for the probe to slide over the skin. Any water-based gel can be used. Manufacturers generally advise against the use of oil-based couplings as they may damage the transducer. Probe covers are recommended in all cases to protect both the probe and patient, such as the use of gloves, clear plastic dressings, or purposely designed cover. Scanning technique. Transducer movements are employed to improve view and locate the target structure. Sliding refers to the movement of the probe across the skin to trace the course of the structure. This aids identification and location of optimal entry points for injection. Tilt. A rocking hand movement that changes the angle the probe makes with the skin. Tilting is useful for obtaining the best view of a structure by altering the angle at which the ultrasound beam hits the target thus maximizing the beam signal strength returning to the transducer. Rotation. This describes a twisting movement used 
to obtain a short axis or long axis view of the target structure. Very small rotational movements may be needed to maintain full alignment of the ultrasound beam and the needle. Short axis and long axis views. These terms relate to how the image of the target structure is visualized. For short axis view, the ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the nerve. The beam is across the target nerve. The nerve is seen in cross-section and will appear round, oval or triangular. The short axis view of a nerve is preferred because nerve identification is easier. There is improved view of surrounding structures and planes. This facilitates needle access to the nerve. Lateral, medial, deep and superficial aspects can all be targeted. There is improved assessment and verification of circumferential distribution of local anesthetic. Slight probe movement will still maintain a workable image. Rotate the probe through 90 degrees and the long axis view is generated where the length of the nerve is visualized. The ultrasound beam is parallel to the nerve in the long axis view. Image optimization. Presets. Most machines will come with a range of manufacturer settings designed to optimize image quality for individual probes and different tissue types. Standard presets are nerve, vascular, musculoskeletal, breast and small parts. Depth should be adjusted to keep the target structure in the middle of the screen. This allows visualization of all the structures around the target and is also frequently the best focused area of the image. Gain. Gain should be set so that it is consistent throughout the screen. It is important as echoes from similar structures should give rise to similar screen brightness regardless of their depth. Focus. On some machines, the focus is fixed to the middle of the screen. If not, then it is important to adjust the focus to the depth of the target structure in order to maximize resolution. Image interpretation. Image interpretation requires a good knowledge of anatomy and understanding of the appearance of different tissues, consideration of how artifacts can affect images, and familiarity with the methods available for interrogating a structure to aid its identification. Important factors. Echogenicity. The degree to which ultrasound beam reflects from a structure and returns to the probe determines the returning signal intensity. This creates images that are hyperechoic, hypoechoic, anechoic or isoechoic. Hyperechoic structures strongly reflect the ultrasound beam to generate large returning signal intensities at the transducer and appear white. Examples of hyperechoic structures include connective tissues, facial layers, pleura, vessel walls, bony surfaces, nerves and tendons. Hypoechoic structures only weakly reflect ultrasound to generate lower signal intensities and appear darker. Examples include fatty tissue, fluids such as blood or local anesthetic, muscle, nerves and tendons. Sonographic appearances. Pattern recognition of the different tissues is critical to identification. This is aided by observing their real-time interaction with the ultrasound probe and beam, such as compression, pulsation, anisotropy, and Doppler shift. Anisotropy is derived from the Greek anisos, meaning unequal, and tropos, turn. This describes the property of now you see me and now you don't, which can occur with ultrasound imaging. Alteration in echogenicity of a structure with probe angulation is termed anisotropy. The angle of the ultrasound beam hits or insonates a structure will determine how many of the reflected echoes are detected by the transducer and how many will fall out of the sight of the receiving transducer. As the probe angle alters, the appearances of the structure being visualized may change and on occasions, the structure may seem to disappear. Nerves and tendons classically illustrate this property. Sonographic appearances of peripheral nerves and surrounding tissue. Arteries appear as anechoic black circles or tubes and are pulsatile. Veins appear as anechoic black circles or tubes, which are compressible and dilate with Valsava maneuver for jugular, subclavian and femoral veins. Tendons. In the long axis view, they appear as tubular structures with fibrillar appearances. In the short axis view, they appear as circular structures with granular appearances. 
tendons are anisotropic. Nerves have fascicular appearances. In the long axis, nerves appear as tubular structures with bright surfaces. The internal architecture has multiple broken bright lines. In the short axis view, nerves typically appear as circular structures with a bright surface. The internal architecture may have multiple hypoechoic black dots, which are the nerve fascicles with bright outlines within bright surroundings, which are the connective tissue and perineurium. There may be a speckled appearance. Appearance varies between proximal and distal peripheral nerves, which will be discussed later. Nerves are anisotropic. The pleura appears as hyperechoic lines. Sliding sign with respiration may occur. The lung is air-filled and is often hypoechoic or anechoic. It is generally characterized by its lack of distinct detail. Reverberation artifacts from pleura, also known as A-lines, can be seen. For bones, the periosteum appears as a hyperechoic line. The cortex and medulla are anechoic due to reflection of the majority of the ultrasound beam from the periosteum, resulting in dropout artifact. Appearances of peripheral nerves Identification of peripheral nerves is not always easy. Knowledge of their distinguishing features is important. Factors affecting the ultrasound appearances of peripheral nerves includes the portion of the nerve scan, size, depth and surrounding structures, and technical factors. In general, the more proximal the peripheral nerve, the more hypoechoic its appearances, becoming more hyperechoic as it moves distally. This is due to alterations in the ratio of connective tissue, which are highly compressed collagen, which reflects ultrasound beam, to form hyperechoic appearances, and neural tissue, which has high lipid content, which absorbs ultrasound beams, resulting in hypoechoic appearances. The ratio tends towards more connective tissue and less neural tissue the more distal the nerve. Along the course of a single nerve, all shapes such as round, oval, triangular and flattened can be seen as the nerve passes between adjacent structures. Larger peripheral nerves demonstrate a fascicular or honeycomb pattern. The size, depth and surrounding structures, such as large muscles, may attenuate the ultrasound beam leading to reduced visibility, such as when viewing the proximal sciatic nerve. Technical factors such as the frequency used, probe design and angle of the incidental beam affects ultrasound appearances of peripheral nerves. Artifacts has been discussed in a previous section. Interrogation. Along with tissue pattern recognition, there are various methods of interrogating a structure to aid its identification such as compressibility with the ultrasound probe, presence of pulsation, changes in the appearances of the structure with the Valsava maneuver, effects of artifacts, such as anisotropy with nerves and tendons, and post-cystic enhancement with a fluid-filled space. The use of Doppler, nerves are often accompanied by vessels with larger nerves. This relationship is usually consistent. Considerable anatomical variation may be present with smaller nerves. Color Doppler flow will identify flow away from the probe as blue and towards it as red. Tracing structures. Tendons may resemble peripheral nerves and are similar in size, shape and their anisotropic nature. Following their course, tendons change their cross-sectional area and end in muscle or bone. Nerves, however, are relatively uniform along their length. Needling techniques. Good technique is based on good understanding of the relative anatomy and repetitive hands-on practice. Never advance a needle unless you can identify its tip at all times. If the needle tip cannot be seen with certainty, withdraw the needle and start again. Needle visibility is determined by insertion angle, needle depth, needle gauge, needle bevel, nature of surrounding tissues, immobility, and advanced visualization techniques. Insertion angle. The more superficial and parallel the needle to the probe surface, the better the reflected image. Steep needles reflect much of the ultrasound beam away from the transducer. A curvy linear probe may improve needle visualization due to the diverging nature of its ultrasound beam. 
improving the angle the bee makes with the needle. Entering the skin close to the transducer results in a shorter distance to the target nerve, which is less painful but forces a steeper needle angle, which reduces needle visualization. Enhanced needle visualization software increases needle visualization at steeper needle angles. Needle depth. As the needle is inserted deeper, it becomes more difficult to see due to signal attenuation with increasing depth. Needle gauge. Larger ball needles such as 18G or Tohi needle have higher visibility due to their larger cross-sectional area and are preferred for deeper blocks. They are also less flexible and less likely to bend out of the plane of the ultrasound beam. Smaller ball needles such as 22G or 24G are harder to see. They are adequate for more superficial blocks. Insertion is less painful with less tissue damage. Needle bevel. Needle tips are better seen when the bevel faces the probe. Nature of the surrounding tissues. Needle visualization is improved with contrast against the surrounding structures. This is best visualized on a dark anechoic background, for example, in a vessel or after LA deposition. Immobility. Once the needle tip is in the desired position, movements such as attaching a syringe, aspirating, and injecting may displace the needle tip and result in inappropriate LA deposition or neurovascular trauma. For this reason, the concept of the immobile needle was described by Winnie in 1969. There are various needles which come with pre-attached extension sets that allow syringe manipulation to be done remotely from the needle hub. Advanced visualization techniques. Various technologies can be used to improve the echogenicity of needles such as coating, roughening, scoring, and dimpling of the surface. This may be applied to the tip of the needle or the whole needle shaft to improve visibility on ultrasound. Needle design. The bevel may be long bevel or short bevel. Standard hypodermic needles are long beveled and are cut to 12 degrees as regulated by British standards. Short bevel needles. The majority of peripheral nerve blocks are performed using short bevel or pencil point needles. These are not BS regulated and may be cut between 18 and 45 degrees and are designed to part rather than cut tissues and offer more resistance to insertion. They have improved feel of the needle passing through tissue planes. There is reduced risk of damaging nerves with a short bevel needle as the nerve fascicles will roll or slide out of the path of the needle tip. However, should the needle enter a neural tissue, the risk of fascicular injury is probably greater with a short bevel rather than a long bevel needle. Insulation. Insulated needles are coated and only emits current from the tip. This allows a much lower stimulating current to be used and more focused stimulation when refining the needle tip position. Catheter insertion. For perineural catheter insertion, there are various kits and designs available, such as Seldinger wire, catheter through needle, and cannula over needle. It is also possible to obtain stimulating catheters to refine the position of the catheter tip. In plane or out of plane. This describes the relationship between the plane of the ultrasound beam and the needle. The choice of approach will depend on the site of injection, the probe and personal preferences. The in-plane approach. The needle and the beam axis are parallel. This may be safer for clinicians starting in ultrasound as the needle tip is more easily visualized. Advantages includes there is full visualization of the needle shaft and the tip. There is good visibility of the needle nerve interface. Disadvantages. It is considered difficult to perform. It requires precise alignment of the ultrasound beam of a width of 1 mm, the needle and the nerve. There is a longer skin to nerve distance and this results in more tissue trauma. Intramuscular needle passage may be painful. There is unfamiliar needle insertion point compared to the standard landmark approaches. Out of plane approach. The needle and beam axis are at bright angles to each other. Advantages includes familiar needle insertion point compared to standard landmark approaches. There is short skin to nerve distance. There is minimal intramuscular needle passage and less pain. 
Disadvantages of the out-of-plane approach includes it is difficult to visualize the tip clearly. The needle is only seen as a white dot as it passes through the ultrasound beam. There is poor visibility of the needle nerve interface. Strategies to aid needle tip identification. Local tissue movement. Hydro location. Small volume of test injection such as 0.1 to 0.5 mL to look for tissue expansion. Avoid air bubble injection as bubbles causes acoustic shadowing and reduces the visibility at the needle tip. The dorsal ultrasound shadow produced by the needle tip. Even if the needle is not well seen, it often produces a dropout shadow beneath it, which can aid needle tip location. Triangulation. With out-of-plane techniques, concentrate on the depth of the target structure and the distance that the needle starts from the probe to construct a triangulation type image. Use this to help insert the needle at the correct angle towards the nerve. For example, a target nerve 2cm deep with the needle entering the skin 2cm from the probe will mean an angle of 45 degrees is needed to ensure the needle tip passes under the ultrasound beam at the point where it is just above the nerve. As the needle is advanced, the probe can be tilted with the tip to follow it as it heads towards the nerve. If the nerve image is lost, Always move the transducer to find the needle, not the needle to find the transducer. Beware with the in-plane approach of a partial needle image. The probe and the needle are in line but for only a certain distance along the needle's length. This results in a false interpretation of the needle tip position as only the proximal part of the needle is visualized. Needle nerve position. Never deliberately contact the nerve. Position the needle close to it but not touching it. This reduces the likelihood of nerve damage and patient discomfort. Peripheral nerve stimulators can be used in conjunction with ultrasound. Place at a low setting such as 0.6 MA and consider only turning the stimulator on when the needle is nearing the nerve. Higher more standard settings result in vigorous twitches that leads to movement and poor quality images. The combined use of ultrasound and peripheral nerve stimulation may have some advantages where, due to the depth of the intended target nerve, there is suboptimal image quality. Some practitioners feel it may help exclude the possibility of intraneural needle placement. PNS may aid the identification of specific nerves where they lie in close proximity. Peripheral nerve stimulation helps confirm nerve identification when learning ultrasound guided techniques. Local anesthetic injection. Inject slowly, watching the screen at all times. The injection should be painless and resistance-free. LA should be clearly seen. If not, consider intravascular injection. Stop the injection and reposition the needle. The needle tip may not be within the ultrasound beam. Move the probe to visualize needle tip and re-inject. The nerve often appears brighter and easier to identify after injection due to improved contrast. If the nerve swells, stop injection and consider intraneural placement, reposition the needle. In extrafascicular injections, the needle position is beneath the epineurium and not inside the fascicles. There is superficial swelling of the nerve but no internal disruption upon LA injection. Extrafascicular injection is unlikely to result in permanent nerve damage. For intrafascicular injection, the needle position is within the nerve fascicles. The whole nerve swells with internal disruption upon LA injection, there is higher likelihood of permanent nerve damage. Nerve and local anesthetic spray. Upon reaching the target nerve, inject 0.5 to 1 mL of LA and observe the spray. This should surround the nerve. Ultrasound enables an improved block with the use of less LA with deposition that surrounds the nerve to create a halo or donut sign. This is most easily achieved using the V technique. This describes the movement of the needle. Advance the needle to one side of the nerve, inject, then partially withdraw and redirect to the other side of the nerve and re-inject. After injection, the probe can be slid along the path of the nerve to check adequate LA distribution. Ultrasound can be used for echocardiography. Imaging can be structural. For example, to identify pericardial effusions or abnormalities of ventricular wall and cavity size. 
echocardiography may be used to assess cardiac function, such as by using Doppler techniques to view blood flow through the valves and cardiac chambers. Transesophageal echocardiography. Modern TOE probes allow 180 views of the heart, and the absence of large tissue masses between the probe and the myocardium allows for well-defined ultrasound images. Examples of uses of transesophageal echocardiography include assessment of valvular heart disease, cardiac output measurement, diagnosis of bacterial endocarditis, identification of atrial thrombi, investigation of congenital heart disease, identification of aortic atherosclerosis, aortic dissection and disease, assessment of paracardiac masses, intraoperative determination of left ventricular preload and function, diagnosis of acute left ventricular dysfunction and myocardial ischemia, and detection of air embolism. Complications of TOE includes perforation, bleeding, and microshock. Kindly refer to specialist texts or courses for further details for echocardiography. Ultrasound may be used for detection of fluid collections. Ultrasound scans of the abdomen and thorax can be used to identify fluid collections such as ascites or hemorrhage which can be drained by ultrasound guidance or open surgery. Ultrasound can be used for ultrasound-guided cannulation of vessels such as arteries or veins. Kindly refer to specialist texts or courses for further details. A Doppler probe over the precordium is sensitive enough to detect air embolism of 2 mm or more in diameter. Ultrasound can be used for cranial scanning in neonates. For example, to detect intraventricular hemorrhage and midline shift. Ultrasound can be used to assess gastric emptying. Ultrasound can be used to scan the cricothyroid membrane for identification during emergency airway access. Other uses of ultrasound in critical care includes assessment of fluid status, assessment of fluid responsiveness, assessment of pleural effusions, pneumothoraces, lung consolidation and pulmonary edema, diagnosis of abdominal pathology, assessment of fetal health, ultrasonic guidance for thoracocentesis or chest tube insertion, and diagnosis of thromboembolism. Ultrasound is also used in other ultrasonic devices such as in gas flow meters, in cleaning devices, and in humidifiers. Ultrasound safety. As a whole, ultrasound is regarded as safe. There are few known biological effects of ultrasound. There are no concerns regarding ionizing radiation, damage to implantable hardware, and side effects related to invasive imaging procedures. Infectious risk. Ultrasound equipment is used on multiple patients daily with exposure to bodily fluids, bacteria, and viruses. Ultrasound machines have been demonstrated to be vectors of disease transmission in the hospital setting. Improperly sterilized transducers can facilitate disease transmission. Personnel using the ultrasound equipment should disinfect the equipment after every use. Ultrasound waves are capable of generating cavitation and heat, and correspondingly may do damage to tissues. Ultrasound waves impart shear forces as well as cavitation and have been shown to cause significant damage in vulnerable tissues in animal models, such as the developing fetal chicken brain. However, cavitation has not been documented in mammalian fetuses due to absence of gas fluid interfaces needed for cavitation to occur. Long-term epidemiological studies have failed to show harmful effects of ultrasound in humans. 2D imaging generates far less energy and heat than Doppler imaging modalities. The spatial peak temporal average, ISPTA, is a measure of ultrasound energy output. For 2D imaging, it is 34 mW per cm squared. For pulse wave Doppler, it is 1,180 mW per cm squared. Acoustic exposure levels during 3D and 4D ultrasound examination are comparable with those of 2D B-mode ultrasound as expressed by thermal index which expresses the potential for a rise in temperature along the ultrasound beam. Ultrasound power should be adjusted as low as possible for good quality images. The Alara Principle Although ultrasound has no known bio-effects at the levels typically used in the absence of contrast agents, 
it is recommended that the total scan time and intensity be kept as low as reasonably achievable. The theoretical concerns about bioeffects of ultrasound are mediated by amplitude and power. When examining potential sensitive tissues such as the retina and developing fetus, selecting the appropriate presets automatically decreases amplitude for most ultrasound machines. After prolonged use, the transducer itself can become hot. Probes that are left in patients for long periods such as transesophageal transducers should be unplugged or placed in standby mode when not being used to let them cool down. Modern transesophageal echocardiography probes will automatically shut off if they reach a user-defined temperature threshold. Ergonomics Attention to ergonomics helps the clinician to avoid pain and discomfort and allows for better conditions to obtain the best images possible. Arm, leg or neck pain are not uncommon amongst sonographers and occur in up to 80% of sonographers. The ultrasound machine. Orient the ultrasound machine in a room such that the operation of the transducer and system controls are comfortable. The height of the bed should be raised or lowered so that the clinician performing the examination does not need to bend or crouch. The patient should be positioned to facilitate optimal imaging. For cardiac examination, either supine and level or left lateral decubitus. In the patient receiving mechanical ventilation, the positioning may be significantly more challenging. However, the time and effort put into this is well worth the improved imaging output. Clinicians in critical care practice should learn to operate the machine and transducer with both the left and right hands because it can be challenging to position the machine optimally in a room filled with machines and monitoring equipment. These are my references. Thank you.